Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to wait a few more minutes to allow uh, our other participants to join. Please be patient. We'll be starting in five minutes.
Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar uh, addressing anti-Black racism in our schools. My name is Len Rudner, and on behalf of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, I'm delighted to have you with us today. As always, before we begin, a few administrative details. We will follow our usual format for webinars. We'll begin with the presentation of our guest, Mante Moepo. At the end of the presentation, I will return to assist with the Q&A section of the program. As always, you may tape your questions at any time during the presentation. My colleagues, Savaika and I, will group or combine similar questions together in order to make the best use of our time together. Our webinars are provided for information and educational purposes only and do not constitute legal or professional advice. The opinions expressed by guests, panelists, and moderators are their own and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. So let's begin. Today, we will examine how anti-Black racism affects the opportunities for students to succeed. We will explore topics such as unconscious bias, racism and discrimination, and consider approaches to address anti-Black racism in schools. We hope that you will leave the webinar with a deeper understanding of the systemic barriers affecting Black students, as well as proactive approaches to close opportunity gaps. Today's presenter, Mante Moepo, is a lawyer, human rights advocate, and equity and diversity advisor. She works with organizations to address equity, diversity, and inclusion, focusing on unconscious bias and anti-Black racism. She is also a founding member of Parents for Diversity, an organization committed to creating equitable and inclusive learning environments for all students. In 2018, Monte was recognized as one of Canada's 100 accomplished Black women. Monte is on the board of directors of human rights organizations, including Amnesty International Canada. Thank you very much, Monte. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that, Len. Um... Thank you all for joining us here today for our Parents for Diversity webinar on addressing anti-Black racism. So this is a webinar for educators from a parent perspective. Before we begin today, I wanted to take a moment and acknowledge that the land on which we are gathered here is the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people, and that my commitment to uh, re a reconciliation is to teach myself and my young children about the history and people of the, the Anishinaabe people and the impact of European settlement, colonialism, and the legacy of residential schools and the 60s scoops, among other uh, injustices. Parents for Diversity really were a collective of parents that are committed to addressing systemic discrimination within schools. We were formed a few years ago by two mothers who whose children were experiencing anti-Black racism within their schools here in Ontario and in Quebec. We were disappointed in large part because of the responses from our educators and administrators. They just didn't seem to have the proper tools and awareness with which to address um, anti-Black racism in a way that preserved the dignity of our children, but also got to the root causes of why these incidences were happening. And that really got us thinking about whether other parents were going through similar experiences with their kids. And um, we spoke to a lot of parents who, who were navigating the school system in the same way that we were. So we formed this organization in large part to address all uh, areas of discrimination. But because most of us have lived experience with anti-Black racism, a lot of our work has, um, has focused on this area. But we do advocate for the right for all students, irrespective of their gender, identity and expression, their race, their religion, sexual orientation or disability, to have uh, the rights to an education that is free from discrimination. So what is unique about the work that we do on anti-discrimination in schools is that we are parents. So we, we offer a parent perspective in everything that we, we do. Uh, we also provide workshops to educators and to parents, as well as work with school boards to address issues around equity in education. We also work with a lot of families who, dis who experience discrimination with schools, and so they often contact us. And we kind of uh, work through ways in which they can resolve some of the issues that they are experiencing with their schools. We also have a diversity library um, because of our belief that every student has to have access to books 
where they see themselves reflected in the images and stories that they are reading. And so this diversity library is on our on our website and our book selections are centered around own voices because we believe that people having lived experiences with, with uh, what they're writing about should be telling these stories. So at Parents for Diversity, our vision really is that within their learning environment, every child feels that they belong, that they are valued for who they are, and that they have access to equal access to rigorous, meaningful, and joyful learning. Today, I'll be referring a lot to parents, and I want to clarify at the outset that when I refer to parents, I also mean legal guardians and anyone really who is acting in the capacity of a parent. We have a, a, about an hour today to talk about a few things, and so one of which is, you know, what are the diff we're going to explore the different types of racism, uh, implications of anti-black racism on students, and ways in which we can challenge anti-black racism in our schools, and then lastly, how to address racism with our students and and parents. Um, our discussion today is really around racism, which the Ontario Human Rights Commission defines as a belief that one group is superior or inferior to others. And what is essential to our understanding of racism really is that it is, it's very much a social construct, which is driven by dominant identities. And that race itself can be fluid. And I say this because I, I often think of South Africa's apartheid regime um, and the 1950 Population Registration Act which required South Africans to be registered in accordance with their racial characteristics, namely white, Bantu or black, um, and colored. And people then could petition uh, the government to change their race. And you often found black people applying to change their race to colored and, and colored people filing a petition to change their race to white. South Africans uh, were subjected then to humiliating tests to determine their race, which was often assessed by examining things like uh, skin color or facial features or even hair. If there was ambiguity or even times uncertainty about an individual's race, then authorities would apply what we call the pencil test in which they would place a pencil in, in the individual's hair. And if it remained in place without dropping, the individual was classified as colored or black. And if the pencil dropped out of the hair, then the person was classified as white. So apartheid's law, then, when we look at it, they really demonstrate how insidious and how, and also how arbitrary race is, primarily because it is socially constructed. We often then think about racism in a way that involves images of individuals carrying tiki torches through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, or when we confront images of blackface or the KKK. But racism, racism really is much more than that. Um, it is deeply entrenched in our society, in its institutions, laws, policies, and practices, as well as in our collective subconscious. So racism can be defined as the cumulative impact of prejudice, power, and oppression. And according to uh, Bonilla Silva, racism involves social institutions, whether they're economic, political, or social, that systematize and perpetuate an unequal distribution of privileges, resources, and power to white people over people of color. It's important to map out the different levels of racism and the different ways racism and oppression operate within and beyond the classroom. So institutional racism is one of them, and this really refers to the policies and practices of institutions and organizations um, that create patterns and affect our everyday realities, the results of these default patterns. So for instance, um, institutional racism would include streaming of black youth into applied courses or school or work grooming policies, as well as racialized food policies. Interpersonal racism refers to the words, actions, behaviors, and beliefs of individual people. So here we see, you know, it, it manifests in the form of statements such as I don't eat, I don't see color, which denies and oftentimes invalidates the experiences of racialized people or the perceptions and corresponding treatment of black children as if they are much older than they are, what we call adultification. And I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later on. We also see cultural racism, which reflects um, really the dominant cultural stories and values that we are all socialized into including the underlying messages we receive from media, 
news, movies, interpersonal interactions. And examples are, you know, the holidays we celebrate, statues and monuments in our cities, how we construct history lessons around the dominant identity, while also ignoring other identities, reflects what we would describe as cultural um, racism. In her book, White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo describes how white children develop a sense of white superiority as early as preschool, as society sends constant messages <clears throat> that to be white is better than to be a person of color. <clears throat> so racism is not just something we inherently possess, it, it, it evolves through our social, socialization in the world. And more specifically, the, we, we are concerned here today with anti-Black racism, which is one of the many ways that racism unfolds in our society. And it has, I mean, this is the definition by the, the government of Ontario, we'll go through it. And the first one is really, that it involves prejudice, attitudes, beliefs, stereotyping, and discrimination that is directed at people of African descent and is rooted in their unique history and experience of enslavement. Natasha Henry, who's a, light, a historian, an educator, and also the president of the Ontario Black History Society, she's actually written quite extensively on this issue and has mapped out the history of exclusion of Black children from public education dating back even to the 1930s. When discrimination against Blacks and segregation was really heavily entrenched in our laws. As well, uh, legal scholar Constant Backhouse has documented the historical exclusion of Black children from schools in cities such as London and Hamilton, Ontario, and the persi persistence of de facto desegregation once slavery was formally abolished. Second, anti-Black racism is really entrenched in Canadian institutions, policies, and practices such that anti-Black racism is either functionally normalized or rendered invisible to the larger white society. Today, the once explicit policy of exclusion really has manifested in more subtle practices and policies that are sometimes applied to all students, but their effects have disproportionate impact on Black students including their ability to style their hair, um, and the practice of academic streaming based on perceived ability, and the opportunity gaps that Black students face in the education system. And lastly, anti-Black racism manifests in the legacy of the current social, economic, and political marginalization of African Canadians in our society, such as the lack of opportunities, lower socioeconomic status, higher unemployment, significant poverty rates and the over of over representation of black people in the criminal justice system. We also want to situate our discussion today on anti black racism within the broader international context. The, um, the international community has recognized 2015 to 2024 as the United Nations international decade for people of African descent. And in doing so the UN has recognized that people of African descent represent a distinct group whose human rights must be promoted and protected. And the decade is centered around three themes of recognition, justice, and development. In 2016, the, at the invitation of the Canadian government, the UN Working Group of Experts on People of African Descent undertook a visit to Canada. And following its visit, the Working Group issued a report which made a number of findings that I want to go through uh, really briefly um, today. So one is that it found that the African Canadians have a unique experience because of the particular history of anti-Black racism in Canada, which is traceable to slavery and its legacy through specific laws and practices enforcing segregation and education, among other areas. It also found that the cumulative impact of anti-Black racism and discrimination faced by African Canadians in the enjoyment of their rights to education and other rights has had serious consequences for their overall well-being. And um, it lastly found that anti-Black racism continues to be systemic, leaving African Canadians amongst the poorest communities in this country. The working group then expressed its concern over anti-Black racism and the lack of social inclusion in the education system in Canada. It found that Black students have disproportionately low educational attainment, high dropout rates, suspensions and expulsions, and that they're more likely to be streamed into applied programs. The 
The working group was um, concerned about over what it described as the devastating impact of racial stereotypes regarding African Canadian students scholastic ability. And later on, we will discuss the impact of how low expectations amongst educators towards black educator black students manifests. In particular here, though, the working group identified three primary concerns, namely the differential treatment of black students, the lack of black and African Canadian history and culture within our curricula, and the absence of black teachers. And so we'll just briefly touch on those today as well. A number of recommendations were issued here um, to the government of Canada, and I'm going to focus on those that are specific to education. The working group called on Canada to ensure that textbooks and other educational materials accurately reflect historical facts as they relate to past tragedies and atrocities, particularly slavery, in order to avoid negative stereotypes about Black people. It also called on Canada to strengthen special measures to increase the level of educational attainment of African Canadian children, in particular by preventing their marginalization as well as reducing their dropout rates. The working group then recommended implementing a nationwide African Canadian education strategy to address the low educational attainment, high dropout rates, suspensions, and expulsions that, experience, that are experienced by African Canadian um, youth and children. As well, it called on the strengthening of Afrocentric educational curricula. The working group then called on provincial ministries to collect disaggregated data and ensure adequate remedies are available to Black students who are impacted by discriminatory effects of disciplinary policies, including racial profiling. And what we've seen across Ontario, well, at least in, in Ottawa, is that some school boards are starting to adopt policies and, and declarations in support of the UN decade. So here in Ottawa, we have the Ottawa Carleton District School Board and the Ottawa Catholic uh, school board who have adopted declarations in support of the UN decade and in doing so they undertake a number of commitments to address the barriers that black students are facing as well as to incorporate the histories of people of African descent in the curriculum. I know it's not very much of, a, of an interactive webinar today except for the end when I'll take some of your questions but I do I often when I facilitate workshops I like to walk people through a reflection exercise to inform our discussion around race and racism. And this is really to kind of get our sense of awareness and experience around these issues. So I'm going to go through a few questions and as I go through them, just take a moment and reflect on your responses to these questions. So the first one is, how has race affected your life? Do you ever feel pressured to style your hair in a particular way? How often do you find the foods you eat at home in the cafeteria? How has race affected where you have chosen or been able to live? How has race affected where you have gone to school? How has race affected your sense of belonging in your community? And lastly, how has race affected how you raise your children, if you have any? So um, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I thought I'd share some of my, my responses. Um, some of these that st st stuck out for me was, how has race affected where you have gone to school? Um, I went to school here in Ottawa. And in high school, um, my first high school, I was there for two years and we, we were about 14 out of almost a thousand black students. And, you know, we, we, we experienced quite a bit of anti-black racism, whether it was uh, one year when a group of students stood up and, and performed uh, um, at a concert and they performed in blackface. And everyone thought it was so entertaining and funny, but I remember just, I was young and I didn't understand why it was so offensive to me and why I felt so humiliated over this experience, but I just, I really felt isolated as a student. Um, and when, and then another incident we had was when it was a, a friend's birthday party and we would, you know, decorate lockers for them. And one year they, they somebody walked by and wrote in big letters, um, the N word. And it was those incidences that really called into question our sense of belonging within the school. and. 
after two years, we, we switched to another school. Another way race has affected my sense of belonging in my community is um, a few years ago, signs were appearing in my neighborhood that said it's okay to be white. And I think this was maybe in response to the Black Lives Matter um, movement. And um, my mother who lives close by to us in, um, in I guess in an upscale um, condo building is often stopped by her neighbors who uh, um, ask her, you know, what she's doing here or are you the cleaning lady? And so that's also got me thinking about how I feel safe within my community and how other members of my family feel safe within their, within this community. And, you know, your neighborhood is supposed to be your safe space, but there have been a number of instances over the years where that also has been called into question. And then lastly, I think as a parent, um, and what's really changed my trajectory in life is the experiences that my kids have had around racism. Um, my two young kids from a young age have been exposed to uh, a lot of racial taunts where they've been told not to play with certain kids because they're not white or they can't touch certain children because they're black. Um, and one year somebody stood up on the bus and yelled out, you know, for no apparent reason, nobody likes black people. And then a few weeks ago, my daughter came home with a coloring image of, um, of a black face mammy. And, you know, when I raised this with the teacher, my concerns about, about this image, she was very dismissive and said that she didn't agree with my characterization of the image. So. These are just some ways in which race has affected my life. And it's important that when we have these conversations, we, we understand our relationship to race and racism um, may not necessarily always be the same as how other people, especially marginalized and racialized groups, experience uh, racism in their society. One way in which um, anti-Black racism does manifest is through microaggressions. And these are really everyday verbal nonverbal and environmental slights, snubs or insults, whether they're intentional or unintentional, in which communicate hostile, derogatory or negative messages to target people based on their membership to a marginalized group. I call them a death by a thousand cuts because they are layered and as the definition suggests, they happen every day. And so they kind of build up and they can have quite an adverse impact on a person's mental health and well-being. When we measure the impact of microaggressions, it's not whether the sender communicating the microaggression perceives these messages as harmful, but rather we need to examine the impact on the recipient of these messages. Um, microaggressions really, they often appear innocuous um, but they are, and, and covert messages, but according to, to um, a number of writers, including Zaretta Hammond, they have the effect of invalidating positive group identity. Progressions also trivialize a person's experience. Um, they are demeaning and they have the effect of communicating that someone is lesser than, which relegates an individual to the inferior status and treatment. And often people feel like they're othered when they hear statements such as, you know, where are you from? No, where are you really from? So rather than talking about them in, in detail, I thought I would just go through um, some statements that I often use when I when I talk about microaggressions. Um, and we can and just I'll explain why these um, would be viewed as microaggressions. So the first one is, um, I don't see race in my students. Uh, so my older ch child had experienced racism at a young age in, in school. And when when my younger child was entering JK, I tried to preempt any um, issues that may arise uh, with, that my elders had experienced, especially since they had the same teacher. So I met with them, the teacher, and I, I said, you know, I thought we could, you know, discuss some strategies that we could employ in the event that they may be a racial incident. And the teacher looked at me and very categorically said, you know, I don't see race in my students. I treat all my students the same. And while her heart was in the right place, the effect of her statement was that it invalidated uh, what would have been my and my child's experience with racism because of her, her refusal to acknowledge that racism is very much alive in our society and that it exists even within her classroom. So she was not able to respond to this uh, in a way that would address incidences of racism in the event that they arise. Uh, I mean, arose, but also in a way that would preserve the dignity of my child. The other one is, I feel uncomfortable talking about racism. 
And as I just want to go back to the definition of racism, of microaggression rather, because it is um, not just verbal, but it also can include verbal, nonverbal communications. And this is important because it's not, um, sometimes our thoughts will then manifest into actions. So when we feel uncomfortable talking about a problem such as racism, then we ignore the problem, which leads to a denial and then a refusal to confront the problem. Black students in particular often complain about how afraid they are talking about issues around race and racism, or even reporting these incidences when they arise. They are then forced to internalize these experiences, which has a really negative impact on their mental health and, when, and well-being. The other statement is, I'm not a racist. I always, um, this one's all, all it's, it's quite sensitive, but it's, it's about the fact that racism is not, is so entrenched in our society, within our institutions, and in, including within our system of education. And as I mentioned earlier, it's not about burning crosses and carrying tiki torches. I, I would be inclined to characterize this as aversive racism, uh, what Schneider, Grumman, and Kutz define as exhibiting racist stereotypes while denying that those thoughts, behaviors, and motives are racist. So people who are aversive racists believe that they support egalitarian principles or equal rights for all. Therefore, these types of individuals would find any thought that they might be prejudiced um, to be aversive. When dealing with, with educators, I think <clears throat> it's important for them to understand that if a parent or student calls them racist, rather than react, it's important to try to understand the context of racial oppression and all our roles within this system. So how, as an educator, do I benefit from systems of inequality? And then lastly, for consistency, I will, I will teach to kill a mockingbird again this year. I was recently at a conference with Avis Glaze in Toronto last week, and, and she was talking about um, how a Black student called her in tears one day because her class was reading to kill a mockingbird. And the student was distraught over the repeated use of the N-word throughout the book. Um, I've heard, you know, for myself, countless students over the years who are offended by having to read To Kill a Mockingbird. And not just because of the N-word, but also because of the way in which Black characters are depicted as dependent on white saviorism. In many ways, Black identities, stories, and experiences are absent from our curriculum. And yet most often students are exposed to black, the only time that black, that students generally are exposed to black people is in English literature when they read books like To Kill a Mockingbird, Othello, or Heart of Darkness. So we have to consider the implications of depicting black people in a way that reinforces racist stereotypes of who we are as a people and the impact this has on all students. How does a Black student internalize the constant use of the N-word read aloud in class? And what does it mean for all other students who aren't provided with narrative stories and history lessons of Black people who have contributed to Canada and to our world? So these are just things that we need to think about when we talk about what microaggressions are and then also how we present our curriculum. When we think about anti-Black racism, we also need to consider how we unconsciously make mental associations that are formed by the direct and indirect messaging we receive, often about different groups uh, of people. The Kerwin Institute for the Study of Race and Ethnicity defines um, unconscious bias as the attitude or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. Unconscious bias is activated involuntarily without awareness or intentional control, and, and it can be either positive or negative. There are key characteristics um, of unconscious bias that are, that is, they are unconscious and automatic, so they are activated without an individual's intention or control. They are also pervasive. Everyone has biases, even those avowing commitments to impartiality. And they do not align, they don't always align with explicit beliefs. So unconscious and explicit biases are generally regarded as related, but they are actually distinct mental constructs. Our, 
our, our, uh, sorry, our unconscious biases have real world effects on behavior, including within the education system, which we are going to um, explore in a few minutes. It's also important to, to remember that biases are malleable and that we can um, unlearn our biases and associations we have formed. The associations that we have formed can be replaced with new mental associations. So then why is unconscious bias problematic? For one, it affects our decisions, behaviors, and interactions with others, and it can lead to the negative treatment of certain members of our society, often those who tend to be marginalized. This is especially problematic within our schools, where we see how unconscious bias leads to deficit thinking and to disproportionate discipline of Black students. talked about racism and microaggressions, but I also want to examine how anti-Black racism um, takes place within our school system. I spoke earlier of the, the report of the UN Working Group of Experts um, that found that Black students have disproportionately low educational attainment, high dropout rates, suspensions, and expulsions, and that they are more likely to be streamed into applied programs. But I think it's also important that we look at what the research is stating on this issue. Um, there are several studies that have examined racial stereotypes against Black students, and one of them is uh, a study from last year that examined the prevalence of racial stereotypes among over a thousand white adults who either work or volunteer with, with children. And here, the researchers found that a high proportion of white adults endorse negative stereotypes towards Black students uh, and, and other racialized groups. So, participants found that these students were lazy, that they were violence prone, that they were unintelligent and having unhealthy habits. Um, I wanna explore the various ways in which anti-Black racism is pervasive in our schools. And we've kind of identified four. So that's really the Eurocentric curriculum, having low expectations that educators have towards Black students, the adultification of Black girls, and disproportionate discipline. And I'll walk through these in a bit more detail. We need to think about how our education system really is centered around white identities to the exclusion of other identities, experiences, and stories. Um, consider for a moment then, like when we think about in my school, if I'm an educator, how do I teach and honor black identities, if at all, right? How are black people reflected in the curriculum? Do I construct history lessons centered around European settlement and confederation? Do I incorporate the contributions of Black people in building what is now considered Canada? We recently um, observed Remembrance Day. So as an educator, do you teach about the Black battalions and their role within the world wars? What books are we reading within our classrooms? How are characters being depicted? Are teachers and principals who are there teachers and principals who reflect the diversity of Canada's population? Um, teachers are such important role models. Do Black students have that opportunity to see themselves reflected in their teachers? We also then need to reflect on the implications of presenting a curriculum that is absent of Black identities and ignores the contributions of Black people to this country and to the global community. We spoke earlier of the invisible layer of racism. Erasing Black history, people, and stories from the curriculum is precisely how this invisible layer blankets our schools and classrooms. And, and I have here um, a quote from the Youth Rex report from 2017, and it identified top 10 issues for Black youth and their families. And it found that anti-Black racism in the education system is, as, is one of the top ways in which um, one of the big challenges that Black families and students uh, face. So we need to consider what books we are teaching in English class. How are Black characters constructed? Do they have agency? Are they strong, accomplished protagonists? Or are we simply reinforcing negative stereotypes about what it means to be Black? We need to be aware of the impact on Black students, but we also need to consider how white students construct ideas about Black people when there is no meaningful and critical thinking about Black identities. 
Another way in which um, anti-Black racism manifests is in the form of, that, of low expectations that educators may have towards Black students. A 2015 report on the consultation into the well-being of Black youth in Peel, in the Peel region, found that Black youth experience isolation and marginalization in the public education system, in large part because educators have low expectations of Black students. Black students have reported uh, numerous times that stereotypes about Black people help to perpetuate educators' low expectations of Black youth, which also limits their opportunities and potential. Zuretta Hammond, um, she's actually written quite a lot about deficit thinking, what she calls an ill-informed belief that a student's failures are attributable to the student's lack of intellectual ability, linguistic inferiority, or family dysfunction. And streaming really is one way in which we see teachers' low expectations of Black students. And this is really the practice of grouping students based on ability. The Toronto District School Board is among the only school boards in Ontario that has been collecting identity-based data um, for a number of years. And according to the TDSB data, there is an overrepresentation of Black students in applied courses, as you can see in the data on the bottom left of the screen. Uh, Black students also complain that they are not supported by their guidance counselors who often encourage them to take applied courses and do not encourage them to pursue higher academic success. The third way in which anti-Black racism manifests is through the adultification of Black girls in our schools. And this is really a form of gendered racial bias against Black girls in which adults view Black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers, devoid of any individualized context. It's important to emphasize, though, that adultification is a bias. So it's not an evaluation of maturity based on an objective uh, observation of an individual's um, behavior. And it's, instead, it's very much of a presumption. A 2017 Girlhood Interrupted Study was conducted by the Georgetown Law Center on Poverty, and it found that adults perceive Black girls as less innocent and more adult-like than their white peers, beginning as young as age five. And the report found that Black girls are found to be needing less nurturing, less protection, they need to be supported less and comforted less. Researchers also found that Black girls are more independent, are perceived to be more independent, that they know more about adult topics such as sex. So why is this problematic? Um, I think in large part, as the researchers had found, was that adultification is a form of dehumanization where Black students are robbed of their very essence of what makes childhood distinct from other developmental periods, which is really their innocence. Adultification contributes to a false sense that Black youth's transgressions are intentional and malicious. In both the 2017 study and a follow-up study that was published in May of this year, um, researchers found that there is a tendency for adults to ascribe the angry Black woman stereotype to young Black girls where they interpret their actions as threatening and disrespectful. And, you know, the consequence of this is that when Black girls express strong or contrary views, adults have a tendency to view them as challenging authority, or more fundamentally, simply they assume that a girl's character is just plain bad. Adultification may lead to disproportionate discipline of Black girls when compared to their white peers. And I think of, um, a situation here in Ontario in, 20, in 2016, when two Peel police officers handcuffed a six-year-old girl's hands and feet following allegations that she had acted violently in her school, kicking and punching school administrators. It calls really into question, I'm sure for many of us, why authorities felt compelled to discipline such a young child with such a strong uh, use of force. The ways that anti-Black racism is also evident is through this disproportionate discipline of, of Black students. The 2017 study that I just talked about um, found that Black girls are more likely to experience exclusionary discipline. Uh, 
um, which are outcomes for subjective reasons such as disobedience, defiance, and detrimental behavior, all of which really depend on a subjective judgment of school personnel. Research, researchers suggest that the phenomenon of adultification may contribute to increasingly disproportionate rates of school discipline for Black students. Uh, we also see evidence of disproportionate discipline here in our schools in Ontario. So uh, again, the Toronto District School Board, which collects disaggregated identity-based data, has found that while Black students make up only 11% of the student population, they are more likely they are more than twice as likely as their white peers to be suspended at least once during high school. And um, I'm pulling some of these quotes from a report by Professor Carl James and Tana Turner from their 2017 report um, towards race equity in Ontario. And these are really statements from parents, uh, from students about their experiences uh, as black students within the education system here. And one of them is, I was playing play fighting with a boy and punched him, the teacher told me, you can go to jail for that. Another one, something funny happened in class. We were all laughing, but I was the one, I was the only one sent to the office. We see these stories unfolding across schools and classrooms uh, in Ontario. So then we, we need to think about how anti-Black racism is impacting our students. When we consider the impact of anti-Black racism, we need to examine the visibility of what it is to be Black and the invisibility of being Black in our schools. Anti-Black racism has the effect of silencing students' voices and their identities. Black students don't see themselves reflected in their curriculum. As a result, they are less likely to feel accepted and have a sense of belonging. This can lead to disengagement where they are no longer active participants within their learning environment. A failure to acknowledge and address incidents of, of racism when they arise can further silence Black students. Um, earlier this year, the Somerset West Community Health Center held public consultations on racism where students complained about anti-Black racism in schools and the lack of trust they had in reporting these incidences. They felt that teachers either don't believe them when they report racism or that teachers minimize the impact of what has happened to them. Intersectionality is also critical when we look at how anti-Black racism um, is experienced by students. This involves the interrelationship between a number of intersecting grounds of discrimination. So as a Black we need to consider that you know a black st female student will have a very different experience in their school than say a black trans student or a black student with a disability. And when we talk about mental health in our schools, we often don't consider the impacts of um, anti-black racism on students and the mental and the impact that it has on their mental health and well-being. According to a report by YouthRex, the cumulative impacts of anti-Black racism include disempowerment, isolation, internalized racism, and poor self-esteem. Black students report that they don't feel safe within their schools. They feel like they can't speak freely about racism or report these incidences when they arise. Um, in Canada, we don't really like disaggregated data on, um, on um, mental health and suicide rates of Black youth, but a recent study published in the Medical Journal of the American Academy of Pediatrics examined the trends of suicidal behaviors among high school students in the U.S. Researchers found that there is a racial disparity in suicide rates, where Black children, in particular Black boys, between the ages of 5 to 11, have experienced an increase in the rate of suicide deaths. Black children from 5 to 12 um, for, for this age group, the suicide rate was found to be two times higher compared to their white peers. And lastly, anti-Black racism is a form of discrimination. I'm not going to go into detail about that today, but I want to highlight that the Ontario Human Rights Code is a provincial law that protects equal rights and opportunities without discrimination. And we often forget, um, or we're not aware, that when children go off to school, 
They have the right to an education that is free from discrimination and that as educators, um, they have a legal obligation to provide learning environments that are free from discrimination, bullying, and harassment. So we've explored racism and the impact of anti-Black racism in our schools. We want then to spend the rest of our session examining ways in which we can challenge anti-Black racism. And a lot of this is centered around us as individuals. Um, and it really it requires a process of self-awareness and self-reflection. Unfortunately, we live in a society where you know, examining issues around race or talking about race and privilege and microaggressions is very challenging to confront and to talk about. So how do we do this in a way that makes us more comfortable and makes us reflect on how we can challenge our, our biases? So one is which one of which is one way to do it is by, you know, reflecting on what our biases are. And also what are our privileges and how they affect our abilities to educate people with identities that are different from us. Mm -hmm. We need to also to be able to uh, recognize and acknowledge that anti-Black racism exists within our society and our role in enabling systems of oppression to exist. We need to welcome the discomfort that really comes with this acknowledgement. In her, in her book, um, White Fragility, Robin D'Angelo indicates that in order, to, in order to understand how white people become so difficult in conversations about race, we need to understand the underlying foundations of white fragility, how being white shapes our perspectives, experiences, and responses. She walks through various aspects of being white, including being born into a culture of belonging. And this is like being able to turn on the television read best-selling books and watch blockbuster movies. And we see images throughout the media that exemplify the white identity. We need to take the journey also of learning about racism, challenging our ideas and having hard conversations about race and racism. Uh, I often hear challenges, for instance, to the practice of streaming, that it really isn't a problem. But, I would encourage people when they feel that they don't agree with some of it, even in this webinar, do the research, consult the data, read um, reports by academics like Carl James and uh, Natasha Henry and Tana Turner. It's not coincidental that Black students are disproportionately overrepresented in applied courses, that they experience high dropout rates, or that the school to prison pipeline even exists. And it's also important to be mindful of, of behaviors and attitudes towards students. How, as an educator, do I, do I even use microaggressions? How do I perceive my students? Do I have high expectations of them? Do I offer opportunities to Black students that, are, that I offer to other students? We also need to be able to challenge deficit thinking. Um, and lastly, we need to develop the critical consciousness about how we can develop and present a curriculum that amplifies Black and traditionally marginalized voices and narratives. For instance, when we look at images in books, posters, and other learning materials in our classrooms and schools, do they reflect the diversity of Canada's population or literature that moves away from racial stereotypes? Um, I showed earlier an image of To Kill a Mockingbird alongside a book um, by Brian Stevenson called Just Mercy. Which, um, which is such a brilliant alternative to To Kill a Mockingbird. We also need to think about how to create safe learning environments for Black students. This is especially important for promoting Black students' sense of belonging and inclusion within their schools. So let's consider the fact that the two prime directives of the brain are, are very simple. It's to be safe and to be happy. Students cannot function in a hostile environment, but when they experience anti-Black racism, they are in that hostile environment and they're experiencing this hostile environment often on a daily basis. I like this quote by Zaretta Hammond um, in her book, Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, where she writes that the brain will not seek to connect with others if it perceives them to be threatening to its social or psychological well-being based on what they say and do. I think about microaggressions. 
what happens when students internalize them throughout the day? For Black students who experience isolation, internalize racism, and poor self-esteem in school because they don't feel safe within their schools. Uh, it's really then incumbent on educators to create spaces for Black students to feel safe. And they do that by building trust. And trust derives from developing positive relationships between Black students and their teachers. I'm going to quote again uh, Zaretta, who writes that the only way to get students to open up is to show that we authentically care about who they are, what they have to say, how they feel. Now, Zaretta Hammond focuses on culturally responsive teaching, which is something that we wanted to talk about today, but I just don't have the time to delve into, it, into this issue. We only have an hour. But she describes how teachers need to build a different kind of relationship with students. In her Ready for Rigor framework, for culturally responsive teaching, she identifies two practices to build rapport with students. And these are affirmation and validation. So affirmation is really about acknowledging the personhood of each student, appreciating all aspects of them, especially those culturally specific traits that have been negated by the dominant culture. So as a teacher, um, I would say, I acknowledge the personhood of my black students through words and actions that communicates to them that I care about you. Validation is another one. Um, it's a teacher's explicit acknowledgement to students that they are aware of the inequities that impact their lives. And while these are concepts that relate to culturally responsive teaching, I wanted to discuss them in the, in the context of addressing anti-Black racism in our school. First, educators must affirm their Black students by acknowledging who they are and seeking to understand their lived experiences. Accountability is also really important to, uh, to ensuring and addressing anti-Black racism in our schools. We need to be able to address racism through a process of reflection, protection of our Black students and families, and having effective responses to racism when it arises or incidences of racism. So when I talk about reflection, I mean having steps uh, that are in place to respond effectively to a situation. So if I, as a parent, complain that there was a racist incident against my child, I need my teacher to listen attentively with an open mind and not to be defensive and shut down. It's also important to, to protect a Black student by validating their experience and listening to their concerns monitoring the impact of the incident on the student. We also need to respond to the problem in a way that preserves the dignity of the student and demonstrates that the school is an environment that will not tolerate racism. Educators need to investigate incidences of racism and take complaints seriously. We often, Parents for Diversity, work with parents who complain that administrators don't even inform them when their children have been subject to racial taunts or slurs or other racial incidences. Parents need to always be informed. They need to be able to ensure that these incidences do not affect their child's sense of identity and dignity. Schools also need to review practices and policies that have the effect of marginalizing Black students and families. This, is, this includes reviewing curriculum or streaming practices or policies uh, that regulate dress codes and how Black students present themselves. And hiring and retention of Black educators is so critical. According to the Ontario Alliance of Black School Educators, there's a large demographic divide between teachers and racialized students in Ontario. Students benefit from having Black and other racialized teachers. Uh, according to a study led by John Hopkins, um, researchers found that having one Black teacher in elementary school not only makes children more likely to graduate high school, it makes them significantly more likely to enroll in college. And all students benefit from having Black and other racialized educators. Educators also need to build relationships with parents and others in the Black community so that they feel safe approaching their teachers with their concerns. And this is easier, it is always easier to resolve an issue if there's already an existing um, relationship in place. We have many newcomers 
uh, newcomer families in our in our schools, and many who are unfamiliar with the school structures, uh, such as parent council or parent teacher meetings. And one way to orient parents around the school system is to bring in community organizations who can help parents navigate the school system. For instance, in a school, um, sorry, in a school environment, uh, bringing in community groups that can work with uh, black families to understand how to navigate the, the school uh, system. Another way is for educators to go into their school communities to have meetings. If as an educator, you feel that it is difficult to get parents to attend school meetings, within the school, then organize those meetings on a Saturday in community centers using interpreters so that they can, this is just one way to increase parent engagement. We also need to start challenging bias in parent teacher engagement. Um, and I think I often distinguish between internal and external engagement. Um, and this is especially um, an issue with, with different cultures um, that have a lot of deference towards educators and the education system. So parents do not challenge what teachers say and do. And it's almost as though in many cultures, um, because of this level of deference, they tend to hand over their care to their children's schools and entrust their children in the care of their, of their educators. Um, we also have to think about the fact that parents work multiple jobs and may not have the time to participate actively in their children's school community. But this doesn't necessarily mean that they're not engaged. And that's why I talk about internal versus external engagement. With internal engagement, parents may not show up to parent teacher interviews or volunteer for school functions and events such as field trips. Um, and they may not even be on parent council. But at home, these parents are pushing their kids to succeed and to work hard academically. And Carl James and uh, Sileom Chapman Niao have written a really excellent article about this in 2018. And they argue that educators, and this is on our website um, under the resources that we have for this webinar. They argue that educators' understanding of what constitutes parental involvement is likely grounded in privileged middle-class values and expectations, which we really need to challenge. Then there's the external engagement. And these are really um, parents who are engaged in their children's school community, volunteering on school trips, sitting on parent council, uh, and engaged in fundraising and other activities. So we again, we need to, to challenge these ideas about parental en engagement, and that not being physically present in the, uh, in the student's school uh, the way we traditionally conceptualize parental engagement does not necessarily mean that black students are not interested in or committed, to, well, sorry, that black parents are not necessarily interested or committed to their children's um, success. And so that's, that, that's it for, for me. Um, I wanted to thank you for this opportunity and inc invite you to follow us uh, we have a website where you can subscribe to our website, parentsfordiversity.com. You may also email us with your questions or any concerns that you may have and follow us on social media on Twitter at Parents for Diverse One and Instagram at Parents for Diversity. We're also on Facebook. So I welcome any questions that you may have. Mante, thank you. Thank you so much for your, for your presentation. Uh, my it's a good thing I'm wearing a loose uh, sweater because my brain is full. I'm going to have difficulty pulling my sweater over the top of my head. <laughs> that was really a lot to cover. Uh, so we do have one question that's, that's popped up on the screen. So we'll take that one first. And as you were talking, I jotted down a few myself. So while we're doing that, I do encourage people to please take some time to jot down your questions and send them to us uh, so that Monty has a chance to answer them. So the first question that came in from one of our participants is, thank you for the participation. Is the data presented mostly Ontario based or is it Canada wide? Often the issue of racism is framed as X versus white. Any evidence on the lateral racist treatments among the presumed minority groups, for example, Asians versus Africans, et cetera. And I guess the supplementary question to that is, under the law, what is the definition of race? 
Um, okay, so there is, um, I, as I indicated before, there's not a lot of disaggregated data, identity-based data. That's in large part because um, there was no requirement for school boards in Ontario to collect them. And the Toronto District School Board really is the only school board that has been collecting that data. And there is on their website, they do have data according to different identity groups. So I would invite um, participants to consult that. There's also school climate surveys that are conducted and I think it'd be worthwhile um, seeking schools to provide those results to parents if they're interested in getting them. I, in terms of the definition of race, I don't believe that there is a definition of race in the human rights code. This is just something that um, may have it may, it may be referred to in case law, but there's no specific definition of race. I suppose it might be difficult uh, given that there's the whole concept of race is, uh, is, is contested in terms of whether it is it, it's a reality or whether it is uh, it, it's societally imposed. Uh, well, I think what, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I, I was just humming to myself. <laughs> oh, I think it's, I don't think that we, it's easy to contest the existence of racism, if that's the question. Um, I think there's a tremendous amount of data, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, that has documented um, systemic racism within all our institutions in society. And that's why I also really refer to the UN report, because that was really um, a non you know, it was it was an international body coming into Canada and examining the situation and the experiences of Black Canadians and 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 really documenting systemic racism across various sectors, including you know in our system of education. Yeah, thank thank you for that. Yeah, if I if I uh, if the wrong word slipped out of my mouth, I think probably just to clarify what I was saying was not so much that not that racism the existence of racism is contested because I don't think it can be, but rather just exactly what race means. You know, when I reflect back, when I reflect back to uh, how the term was generally understood, let's say, you know, 25 years ago, I think uh, there's been a significant uh, revision in the way we look at it. So a second question uh, from our audience is, what would it look like to respond to anti-Black racism, first, in the moment, and second, in the curriculum, and Third, what sort of programs, uh, I suppose, would help people develop their, their ability to respond uh, usefully uh, to these challenges? In, in the moment, I think um, it's often very hard for us, and I see this a lot, and even myself, when, I, when I'm a in a position of privilege and I experience a form of discrimination, there's a lot of uncertainty and a fear maybe in challenging uh, or speaking up when people confront racism. And so I would say that one way to do so is just to speak up and to challenge it and to say, you know, if somebody makes a racist statement to say, you know, I find, you know, this may be an inaccurate representation, for instance, of a black person. And this may be, uh, you know, you might want to consult, uh, you know, think, think a, a little bit more critically about how impactful your statement or your perception of of someone may be. So I think a big thing is is always speaking out when people confront racism. Um, so your second question was about the curriculum? Yes. And how to challenge that? Uh, well, was uh, how do we, yes, how would we respond to anti-Black racism in the curriculum? I think that's a really excellent question. Um, there's so many ways which we can do it. One is, um, you know, looking around your classroom, if you're a teacher, um, the images on your wall, do you, do you, um, do you, how do they depict people of African descent? Um, in your presentation of the curriculum, your teaching practices, how you present the curriculum, do you incorporate the experiences, uh, voices, uh, histories of people of African descent? And if you do, do you do it in a way that is positive, that doesn't reinforce racist stereotypes um, and false narratives about Black identities? Um, 
A big one is in literature because oftentimes, and this is certainly what my experience was going through secondary school was, we never learned about black people except when we were in English class, when we had to read Heart of Darkness or Othello or um, To Kill a Mockingbird. And these books, especially Heart of Darkness and um, To Kill a Mockingbird, really reinforce negative ideas about what it is to be black. Um, you know, Heart of Darkness describes black people as savages, as uncivilized, um, which is far, which is not who we are as a people. And so what that does is it kind of reinforces ideas about, about a, a particular racial identity that is inaccurate. And so we need to be able to challenge that. Can we select books that we're teaching in English literature that um, are written by black authors, for instance, that don't often um, center around issues that, you know, like, like criminal justice or the stereotypical scenarios that black people often are depicted in. So why don't we have books that um, where black people are just everyday characters, you know, and on our divide, di sorry, on our di diversity library, we have a section of black books uh, using own voices um, in large part where we have so many selections of books that um, tell different stories of black people, um, black narratives, black histories that are important for us as educators to, to be able to teach within our classrooms. And when we do that, when we incorporate those black voices and identities into the curriculum, we can start dismantling um, our biases and, and misunderstandings about what it is to be black. Excellent. Uh, so the third part of the question I asked about how to, uh, it says, how what would it look like to respond to anti-black racism in programs? I'm not sure if uh, the person is asking for uh, programs to deal with these challenges or you know tell or or some other kind of program perhaps we can go on to the next question and if uh the person who submitted that question would like to come back and clarify uh number point number three we can return to it uh so uh we were also asked uh somebody mentioned um mentioned an alternative to kill a mockingbird uh, and we're just being asked if anyone remembers that title. Oh, I had suggested um, Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. And if, and again, there are also other books on our library, uh, diversity library for that age level. Um, there are amazing black writers like Langston Hughes, um, Richard Wright, uh, James Baldwin, Maya Angelou, Chimamanda, and Gozi Adichie, all of these incredible Black writers who have written amazing literary works that we could be using as alternatives to, to Kill a Mockingbird. But I mean, one that struck out for me was Brian Stevenson's um, Just Mercy because it's about, you know, and it's, it's a true story. He's a Black lawyer. He's working in the South on criminal justice reform. and. He is just an incredible person. And so I think it's an opportunity for our students, all students, to learn about how Black people are changing the world and, 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 and fighting for our justice and human rights. Okay. Superb. Th thanks. Thanks very much. And of course, you know, you're, the, list, the list that you provided uh, you know, reminds me you know, that there's a lot of exciting literature that's being written, believe it or not, in places outside of North America. And we, you know, we can we can all broaden our reading lists uh, geographically. You know, um, that would probably all do us some good. Um, another question: When confronting racism, what would be a non-confrontational approach a caregiver could take to avoid a negative initial response from the recipient? Sorry, can you repeat that again, please? Yes. Confronting uh, racism, what would be a non-confrontational approach a caregiver could take to avoid a negative initial response from the recipient? Okay. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not certain if. Uh, I'm not certain how that question is is aligned uh, to your topic. But if you have if you have uh, some thoughts on that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure we'd be we'd love to hear them. So how to, to have that discussion with the person who, who was subject to the racist, to the racism. Yes. 
I think a big um, a big thing is to t have a conversation around it if that person feels comfortable doing so. Because I uh, again, this goes to what I've said throughout the webinar. There's often this really big discomfort in talking and addressing racism when it arises, and um, what it does is it invalidates people's experiences around it, um, and then has the effect of silencing them, which then they internalize, right? So when if a caregiver um, notices that somebody in their care has experienced racism, I think the first step is really having that conversation with them to make sure they're okay to reassure them that, you know, they'll take steps to address the situation. But then if they do do that, they, they have to take meaningful steps to address it. Um, and then to continue the conversation, uh, not with not just with the person who was on the receiving end, but to the person who perpetuated the, the racial act or, or slur, or whatever it was. Um, again, it's, it's also creating a culture within any environment that, that is welcoming and inclusive, and we have to be able to do that by confronting racism when it arises, having conversations around racism, but also to being accountable by having policies in place that are effective and in a way that can address these incidences when they arise. I hope that kind of answers it. All right, uh, another question from, uh, from our audience. Uh, are you aware of uh, any research that's being done in particular, particularly we focused on the BC education system. In British Columbia? Yes. Unfortunately, no, I'm not. Um, I've really focused a lot of my work on Ontario just because it's where we, we work with most of our parents and where, you know, our kids are having their experiences. But ideally, as we're as an organization that is growing, we would like to branch out, um, look at that. But I would say that I know it's not specific to British Columbia, but the, um, the research from the UN report is, uh, is, is, is with respect to all of Canada. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, yet another question. Please do keep them coming, folks. Uh, in the literature on anti-Black racism, uh, do you find that researchers are making linkages with Indigenous peoples anti-Indigenous racism, and Indigenous sovereignty. Can we speak about anti-Black racism? Well, I, in, in, the, in the literature, I, I, I will interpret and say that, you know, uh, when, when the researchers are, um, are, are, are speaking on the topic of anti-Black racism, are they seeing uh, linkages or similarities, uh, you know, similarities of, of impact, similarities of the mechanism, of, of the racism being imposed upon the uh, upon the target community. Yes, absolutely. And Carl James has looked at that. And, and there are a lot of there's a lot of research that looks at the impact of um, the, the disparities that Black and Indigenous and other people of color face within the school systems. Um, and there are many many parallels that are drawn between the experiences of Black students and Indigenous students. Uh, the the disproportionate discipline is definitely something that Indigenous students would face. Um, the lack of re the, the representation within the curriculum is another one. Um, the streaming of Indigenous students into applied and academic, the low expectations, the unconscious biases, all of these, I would say, are um, experiences that Indigenous students would also be uh, exposed to. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, another question, this coming from, uh, from British Columbia. Thank you for your presentation. Have you provided or would you have recommendations for school boards about interpreting and implementing school policy, keeping conscious or unconscious bias in mind? Uh, and here's the money part of the question. Do you have any seminars on bias in the school system? Yes, we do. We do a lot of workshops on unconscious bias in the education system. Um, and that's what I am also the equity advisor for the Ottawa Catholic School Board. And a lot of the work I do is unconscious bias training and a lot of school boards are doing this. So, but yes, Parents for Diversity does. We do um, a lot of workshops, interactive workshops on unconscious bias for educators where we explore um, how and the many ways in which unconscious bias manifests within the school system. 
Okay. It, you know, it, it's, it's a good thing that you have your contact information up on the screen. I suspect uh, many of our participants will be making use of uh, your, uh, your email and the website. Um, That's fantastic. Right. So uh, another question. Uh, you mentioned, quote, affirmation and the use of culturally sensitive language or words, end quote, as a way in which teachers can challenge anti-Black racism. How can we ensure that teachers don't, quote, overdo it, unquote, or fall into cultural appropriation? I, I guess I, I'm, not con I'm a bit confused about the cultural appropriation part. Um, right, so perhaps we can put that one aside. Uh, and yeah, if so I, I'm trying to answer the question. Um, I guess. So is the, is the question that, sorry, I don't have the question in front of me, so it's hard for me to see. But the issue is um, about validation and, <clears throat> sorry, affirmation. I think, um, so the reason, uh, go ahead. I was going to say perhaps, you know, the issue is that uh, perhaps the, what the questioner is uh, suggesting is that in attempting to be, uh, to, create, to create a safe, a safe environment, uh, can we, uh, for, for our Black students, can we perhaps go too far, you know, and, you know, almost, almost create, almost create a, uh, create an environment of the, you know, that, I know, that, that fawns, that, that, fa that fawns on the student, uh, you know, and, 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 antis and antis anticipates microaggressions uh, where perhaps none might, none might actually you know, be be there. You know, yeah. I didn't do a very good. I didn't do a very good job of that. I'm sorry. <laughs> the reason I'll maybe I'll explain why I, I focus on affirmation and validation is is the essential need to in, to create. We need to start dismantling attitudes, behaviors, and biases that educators have towards Black students. And this is not just conjecture. There, I mean, we we walked through quite a lot of data today that explores how these perceptions are so entrenched within the education system. So through the process of affirmation, it's just, we need to start looking at these students as individuals, as people who have dignity, who are there to be part of, a, uh, to thrive within their learning environments. They're just like every other child. They need the same recognition and opportunity to succeed. And so we talk about affirmation and validation because these are, things that are often missing when we talk about the interactions between educators and, and Black and other racialized students. And so um, the, the idea of acknowledging the personhood of a child, of a student, is simply that, looking at them as a person. And I really did want to get into the whole idea around culturally relevant pedagogy, because that is very inherent in, in, in the way in which we start to improve uh, achievement gaps or close achievement gaps and, and, and create opportunity gaps for black and racialized students by first understanding culture, you know, um, and drawing out that culture, developing high expectations, the cultural competence and critical consciousness in teaching black students. Um, and so I don't think that that is possible at this point in time because we, we have such disparities in, in the way in which Black students are treated within the school system that uh, I think it, it goes to more, how do we find approaches and implement these approaches in a way that can change the um, opportunities for Black students? Thank you. Uh, yet another question. When looking at and collecting the identity-based data in schools, how could we account for the diversity of the Black student population? For example, trying to account for the multiple racial categories, Black and South Asian, Black and Latino, Black and East Asian. These multiple groups of students would arguably have different nuanced experiences of anti-Black racism, since they would have perhaps experienced different barriers. Yes, I, so is this in, in trying to draft um, surveys to to identify the different groups or is this just in how we respond to the different experiences not, not entirely certain but i but i would but if you have the uh if you feel that you can uh you know i suppose it would be it could be both you know how do we 
how do we use proper instruments to, uh, to capture the diversity and having captured it, what do we do with it? So the Ontario government, because I was on a call with them last week and about just collecting disaggregated data, and they went through the different ways in which they would identify racial groups. And it's never going to be perfect, you know, and I've also seen, and this is interesting too, like how do we include, you know, racialized or mixed race students who maybe there's some some surveys for students that don't even give that option. And so that students then are forced to have to kind of pick and choose which racial group they belong to. There's there are different problems with the way in which we um, create these identities. Um, and in terms, sorry, your second point was how we, I think that um, it's very difficult to respond to every, um, every student has a very different response to um, racism. And that's when we talked about intersectionality and why that we cannot kind of create a blanket form of treatment for, for students simply because they're black or that they're South Asian. They're going to have very different intersecting experiences. But at the end of the day, we can really find that there are generally some variables that would constitute racism or discrimination, such as streaming practices or the lack of representation within the curriculum, uh, microaggressions, unconscious biases. These are all different ways we can we can address racism that may apply to all groups, if that if that helps answer the question. All right, so I'm very conscious of the time. Uh, Monte, I'm going to put you on the spot. We only have time really for one more question. If some of the folks who have questions in the queue uh, want to send them to info at parentsfordiversity.com. Um, you know, would you uh, would you be open to being able to respond to those as your schedule permits? Oh, absolutely. We would welcome any emails and, you know, email us, uh, follow us on, on, on social media, send us messages on social media as well. We're happy to uh, to email to respond to any of your questions. Great. So we're going, going to ask uh, offer one more question. And by the way, for those who have asked Yes, after uh, probably at some point next week, uh, this webinar, which is being recorded, will be offered on the uh, Race Relations Foundation website. So thank you very much for asking and for prompting me to remind folks uh, of that. So the last question, uh, Monte, is as parents of racialized children, what strategies would you offer to have these conversations with defensive teachers and school administrators to ensure support for racialized children in schools? Oh, I love this question. <laughs> I struggle with this. I, I've been keeping an eye on this one. I wanted to do this one last. So what conversations I would have with my, my teachers and administrators. Um, I have had this conversation a lot and it has not been easy. Um, so my first thing to say is that keep having the conversations because at some point, and I've noticed that there are changes within my kids' schools. I think it's always important to, and what I've really tried to do is increase um, awareness around the need for diverse texts and literature uh, and images in the school that reflect not just my kids' identities, but like the diversity of our rich countries' uh, diverse populations. And so having those conversations and also, you know, the unfortunate thing is as parents, the responsibility, even though it shouldn't be, does fall on our shoulders and I've had to go out um, and put together book selections or um, offer to create a subcommittee uh, for the Parent Council on Diversity and Inclusion, um, going in doing Black History Month and reading books. I think first and foremost is having those engaging conversations and being persistent and offering um, suggestions. It's not easy because obviously we're not only just parents, but we're all, many of us are working um, but that's been my my approach. Um, and also when my experience has also been, and I talked about this earlier, is a key, there have been situations where I haven't even been informed of incidences of, of racism that my kids have experienced. I found out from a friend of my kid or my children have told me, rather than the school calling and calling me and informing me of something this that is that serious. And so having conversations around what my expectations are in dealing with incidences of racism um, that I need to be informed like any other situation that would cause harm to my child. Um, 
having to keep your school um, officials accountable to your child and 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 then maybe it's the lawyer coming out of me when things get really bad reminding them that this is not something that they are you know have a choice in doing but they have an, a legal obligation to provide my child with a learning environment where they are free from discrimination and so i think it's just always important to remind educators of of those things so it's a good way to end our to end our discussion although I hope that uh, through email and through other uh, means, uh, the dialogue will continue um, between our participants and, and you, Monte. Uh, I'd, like I'd, like I'd like to thank you, Monte, for taking the time to share your wisdom with us this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank uh, all the participants who stayed at their computers and their offices and elsewhere uh, on a Friday afternoon. Um, I wish everybody a great weekend, and if you're getting snow, please drive carefully. Thank you very much. It was such a pleasure. Thank you all. Have a great weekend, one and all.